All right. Well, we can probably go ahead and get started. Thank you, Sam, for the tunes. Man, Garth Brooks, Thunder Rolls. That's a that, that's an oldie. That's a goodie, though. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bradley East. I am the ASCE Austin branch president, albeit for for just a, a few moments longer. Uh, I hope everybody had a had a great summer. Thanks for uh, joining us for today's luncheon. We've got a, a pretty jam packed meeting, so we're going to go ahead and, and just jump right into it. So as I noted in my president's message, you know, we had every intention back at the beginning of the summer of, of kind of transitioning back into in-person events come the fall. You know, unfortunately, because of the, the recent COVID surge and because of guidelines handed down from ASCE National, you know, we've, uh, we've made the executive decision to, to keep things virtual for the remainder of the calendar year. You know, my hope is that starting in 2022, you know, we can, we can go back to business as usual and, and start doing in-person events again, you know, fingers crossed. We uh, unfortunately don't have a sponsor for today's meeting. If you or your company are interested in sponsoring a luncheon and or the branch, you know, please reach out to our incoming corporate sponsorship chair, Amos Emerson. Uh, you're also feel free to reach out to, uh, to any of our, our officers. And Paul, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you for announcements, go for it. All right, thanks Bradley. Uh, well, I will go ahead and consider that little plug, our first announcement there. Uh, I still have Austin's info up on the screen uh, because he's still the sponsorship chair for another 10 or so minutes maybe. Um, but the, the email on the screen uh, will go to our new chair uh, once he takes over, Amos. Uh, so again, if your company is interested in sponsoring the Austin branch, um, including our, our meeting sponsors, uh, please reach out uh, and let us know. Uh, up next, we're going to have uh, an update from YMF. Um, Kaylin, are you ready? Sure thing. Thanks. So introducing myself, I'm Kaylin Hudson. Um, I work at Freeze and Nichols and I'm the new YMF director. So the liaison between the Austin branch and our YMF um, board. Um, so just a couple things. Picture here, we had a barge party this summer with YPT. It was super fun and the golf tournament went really well. So thank you everybody that participated. Um, this next year, we're gonna continue with our high school scholarship and we are planning on doing a cidercade outing in October um, and costumes are required. So if you guys are interested in doing that, be on the lookout, sign up for our newsletter and hopefully we'll see you there. All right, thank you, Kaylin. Uh, next up, we're gonna have uh, Lizzie from EWB tell us what's going on uh, with Engineers Without Borders. Lizzie, you ready for us? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Lizzie, president of at the Greater Austin Chapter of Engineers Without Borders, and we are having a creek cleanup this Saturday at 9.30 a.m. We're cleaning up Shoal Creek and our, our little stretch is from 29th Street to Shoal Creek Boulevard. Um, and on that slide, we have where we'll meet, which is at the parking lot for Shoal Creek off Lamar. Um, and we have a calendar on our website on the events page. So feel free to go there for the information as well. Um, and also my email is on the website and you can email me at president at engineerslovebordersgreateraustin.org if you have any questions. Um, hope to see you there. Thanks, Paul. Great, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, Bradley, I'm turning it back over to you now. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our new ASCE Texas section president, Mr. Patrick Beecher, who will be installing our new board. So Patrick is a senior principal and the geotechnical services manager for Terracon's Houston office. He's been with Terracon since 1999. Patrick has previously served ASCE and many officer and committee chair positions at various branch 
and section levels. It is worth noting that Patrick got his ASCE start in 1999 as the Austin Branches Newsletter Ads Committee Chair. Patrick received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Engineering degrees from Texas A&M University, which we won't hold against him. Uh, welcome, Patrick. Uh, feel free to, to take it away. All right. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, great to be with, with the Austin branch today. Again, that, that is where, uh, where I started with ASCE as a professional. Uh, so good to be back. Uh, hopefully, uh, when, uh, when y'all have in-person meetings, uh, next year, hope I have an opportunity to come up and, uh, and see y'all face to face, uh, certainly enjoy the technology we have, but, uh, doesn't replace face to face, but, uh, great y'all are having meetings and, uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Uh, so I'm here today to install your new officers for, uh, 2021, 2022. I'll read their names uh, and then get into the installation. So we have Sam Shorter as president, Paul Hahn, president-elect, Tyler Duby, vice president programs, Leanne Catalupo, secretary, Janest Landry, treasurer, Augustine Grengia, treasurer-elect, and also vice president uh, professional affairs-elect on the uh, Texas section board. So he's pulling double duty there. Austin Mazzarelli, Mazzarelli, sorry, communications director, Kat Lauer, section director, Kaylin Hudson, younger member director, and Bradley East, past president. So we'll begin here. Election to a position of leadership in a volunteer organization is an honor and a unique responsibility. Your fellow members in electing each of you to your respective offices have given you their trust. They have expressed confidence that you'll be able to discharge your various duties with effectiveness and distinction. As officers of the Austin branch of the American Society of Civil Engineers, you will represent your membership to the citizens of this geographic area. As a civil engineer, you have dedicated your professional and technical knowledge to the advancement and betterment of society. You have pledged to do your best to participate at the highest ethical standards of professional engineering conduct and to serve the public above all other considerations. Do you pledge to uphold the governing documents of the American Society of Civil Engineers and those of the Austin branch? And do you, in the presence of your fellow members, pledge yourself faithfully to discharge the duties of the, of the office to which you've been elected to the best of your ability? If so, please unmute and or state in the chat, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. Thank you. And now, will all members of the American Society of Civil Engineers present uh, as they're able to uh, please respond to this? You have heard the pledge of your officers elect. Unless they have your wholehearted support, they will not be able to fulfill their pledge so faithfully given. Do you therefore promise to support your officers as they guide the Austin branch through the coming, coming year? Will you assist them whenever you are called upon for help in undertaking the various activities they plan? Will you encourage and advise them and refrain from unjust criticism of their plans and actions? If so, please unmute or state in the chat, I will. Let these mutual pledges be your commitment to the, that the American Society of Civil Engineers may be an increasing greater force for the well being of all citizens of the world whose lives are impacted by our civil engineering projects. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, thank you for your participation. As a delegated representative of the, of the president and board of direction of the American Society of Civil Engineers, I now declare each of you officially installed in the office for which you were elected. My congratulations and best wishes to each of you. And I look forward to great things from the Austin branch in the coming year. Now, past President Bradley, will you please ensure that the gavel is handed over to President Sam by this symbolic act the authority and responsibility of leadership is transferred to you and the new officers. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to y'all. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and, and congrats to, to all the, the incoming officers. Uh, job well done. So before I, I turn it over to Sam, I just wanted to give a, a big shout out to the outgoing board, committee chairs, and, and committee volunteers. You know, I wish 
again, I wish we were doing this in person and, and you could stand up and be recognized, but, but you know who you are. You know, without your time, energy, and dedication, none of this would be possible. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to our new president, Mr. Sam Shorter. Sam, take it away. All right. The symbolic gavel is being passed right here, baby. Anyone who knows me uh, knows that uh, Sledgehammer is more my speed. Uh, and this bad boy has some history. Eighth grade, one of my best friends, dad was doing some remodeling. He said, Sammy, come over. I need, I need you. You're strong. And I had glasses and that sledgehammer and just busted out walls until I went a little too far. Uh, and I accidentally did a little too much demo. And so point being, uh, it's really easy to, to break things down or people down, but it's a lot tougher to, to build up a good organization. And so we have a great organization. And I'm excited this year. Um, just a little more about me. Um, anybody who's ever met me knows I'm from Longview, Texas, born and raised. Uh, applied to one school. I knew I wanted to be a civil engineer around, I don't know, early high school or middle school. And uh, went to the great University of Texas and started my professional practice here in Austin, Texas. Um, I was exposed to ASC early uh, in college. And then I got the old nudge from my first boss. And then uh, several years ago, uh, Casey Paul uh, really gave me a nudge and I started getting involved at the at the board and committee level. And um, a few years later, I'm more than blessed to be president. And so uh, I'm excited for this year. Um, and I have nothing but optimism, um, even with everything that's going on with society. And so, um, you know, we are a professional society. We, we offer great educational opportunities, community outreach and networking. And I'm excited to begin this new year. Uh, we recently had our board meeting and uh, last month, and we can report that we are, our financials are in great shape. Um, we plan for these kind of scenarios where we might have reduced meetings or revenue. And so um, we do have some uh, new board and committee members. Uh, we've got some you know, young graduates or new to the profession. We have people moving in from other regions. And so there's a lot of, a lot of excitement in the group this year. And so, um, you know, today we officially transfer duties. Uh, you should expect to start seeing a lot more communication um, and also an updated website and things like that. And so uh, with that, I will end my introduction and go ahead for the uh, speaker intro. I'm sorry, pass the baton to Paul Hahn, who will provide the speaker intro. Oh, too far. All right. Well, thank you, Sam. Congratulations again. We're very excited for this year. Uh, looking forward to supporting you. Um, so today's speaker, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Couch with Austin Transit Partnership. Uh, David is an accomplished executive with over 30 years management experience in transit. He has a track record of establishing, managing, and completing projects on schedule and within budget using design bid build, design build, and guaranteed maximum price contract formats with a combination of financing methodologies. His projects include heavy rail, light rail, and commuter rail from the environmental phase through design, construction, and placing into revenue service. David currently serves as the program officer for Project Metro in Cap Metro in Austin. Uh, Project Connect, excuse me. Uh, all right, so welcome, David. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Stop sharing for a second and switch to your PowerPoint. Um, as I'm doing this, uh, everybody on the call, uh, if you have questions for David as we're going along, please place them in the, uh, in the chat or in the Q&A session, uh, and we will uh, see if we can get some answers from David uh, at the end of the meeting. Uh, so let's see, here we go. All right. David, are you ready to take over? Uh, I'm all set. All right, just let me know when you're ready to switch slides. Okay, uh, well, let me start by thank you for the opportunity to go ahead and provide the presentation and talk to you today. Uh, to give you an update on where Project Connect is, uh, we have been 
in the process uh, and working uh, basically uh, at a super pace ever since the referendum last year uh, as we go ahead to advance the program. Next slide, please. Austin Transit Partnership is something that was formed for the implementation of Project Connect. It is a partnership between Capital Metro and the city of Austin. Uh, that goes forward with the funding coming from each one of the entities that flows into Austin Transit Partnership uh, that allows for the implementation of the overall program. Once the program is implemented, uh, Austin Transit Partnership will in essence dissolve uh, and Capital Metro will go ahead and take over the operation of everything that's in Project Connect. Next slide. Part of that is providing what it is that is the portions of the program uh, that will be in essence managed under each section. Austin Transit Partnership uh, will basically do the orange and blue line uh, the tunnel work that is required, facilities work for maintenance, and then the first part of the green line uh, that will go out to Colony Park. Uh, Capital Metro will do what we've basically termed the rubber tire projects. Uh, there are already two Metro rapid lines that are in place to do Metro Express, neighborhood circulators, and all of the other pieces that are improvements on the red line. Uh, the city really is going to do the transit supportive anti-displacement work uh, and also utility relocations permitting and help with the right of way. Next slide. We always at the beginning of presentation start with what we've committed to uh, in the contract with the voters, which is the overall sequence plan. If I go to the lower portion of the chart, uh, that takes you to Metro Rapid, the Metro Express, the things that I said previously really are the rubber tire projects that are going to be executed by Cap Metro. That gives us the lead in to start for the delivery of the program as we work through the early phases of the light rail. As I'm sure you're aware, as we go through that process of, in this case, doing full environmental impact statements, that will take us through the point of about the next year and a half that then culminates in going into the design phase and ultimately out into construction uh, in about year four. So to be able to provide the early work and the early benefits of the program, that's why the rubber tire projects are in the beginning. Uh, that can get accomplished as we work through the process to be able to get into construction uh, for the two principal lines, the orange and the blue. Next slide. These are the program components. Uh, the two main ones are the core of the system, the orange and the blue line. The goal line initially was looked to be something that would be light rail. Uh, it's gonna start out basically as the bus rapid transit, and then in the future, it will be converted to light rail. Uh, one of the core features, and I'll go through a little bit later, is the tunnel. And then really the balance of these are the items that are the Metro rapid projects, the things that are gonna be executed for park and rides uh, and all the other components that are there that are the early deliverables in the overall program. Next slide. This gives us an implementation timeframe and shows where we are in that process for the orange and the blue lines. Uh, we have gone through the portion that is the scoping uh, we're working towards the draft environmental statement right now, looking at the final EIS about the end of 22. As we go beyond that, we go through the continuation of the New Starts program, anticipating that this will be um, a share from FTA of approximately 45% <clears throat> of the program cost, excuse me. Uh, then all the way through until we get to the full funding grant agreement, which really is the contract between the entity and FTA uh, to deliver the project within scope and budget. Uh, all the way through the training, uh, which is something because light rail is new uh, to Austin, uh, it's gonna take extensive training, bringing people in that have light rail experience 
uh, to be able to go ahead and start and manage and maintain the system. Ultimately with revenue operations, uh, the culmination in 2029. Next slide. Get you into a little bit more detail. Uh, the third one that's on here in the summer of 21 is a major accomplishment that we just went through uh, basically in the last month and a half. Uh, the portion of basically the FTA program that is there for new starts includes entry into what is called project development. It starts you through the process that is a lot of the administrative and procedure documents that are required, the risk assessment and other components that are needed when you get to the end of project development to go into engineering and ultimately out to the full funding grant agreement. So it's a very important milestone that we hit. Uh, it is something that we had that goal and we had that within the schedule to be able to do that. Uh, and it's a major milestone in a program of this size. Going through the draft environmental impact statement, review by FTA and early summer next year, completion to the 30% design uh, and also a, an estimate of what the overall program cost would be. Continuing through the rest of the environmental process, looking to achieve the FTA NEPA record of decision, basically at the end of 22, uh, early in 23. Next slide, please. Uh, in parallel with that, as I've said, the rubber tire type of projects, uh, the first two are the Metro Rapid Lines uh, for Expo and Pleasant Valley. Uh, we've gone through that process and the most recent milestone uh, is the vehicle contract is going to be awarded uh, by the CAP Metro Board at the next meeting. Uh, we've already gone through the procurement for all of the engineering services that are required and we're looking at the end of the year to go ahead and start construction. Uh, then we go through the rest of the small starts program, uh, getting us to an overall grant, uh, and then out through revenue service that takes us in towards the end of 2023. Next slide. As I said, one of the important milestones that's there on a new starts uh, program is that entry into project development. It is that critical milestone for a series of reasons. Uh, it takes us to the point that the project is recognized by the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, it goes into what is called the annual report to Congress, uh, which is something that FTA develops every fall. So this will enable us to have the project listed uh, this next year. Uh, there won't be anything with it that will be a rating or any cost. It just gives that first time and that first sign and visibility at a national level of what the project is. We continue and go through the milestones that are there in project development. And one of the things is to complete that process within 24 months. So that's our target to get to that point, which will then be followed by going ahead through engineering and ultimately to that full funding grant agreement uh, sometime in mid 2024. Next slide. As we begin to go ahead and move into things that are field activities, uh, on the right, you can see the typical pictures that you all have been through uh, with the start of soil borings. We're working through and have just finished the 15% design uh, and done basically review with the city and our other partnering partner agencies. We're looking at what the effects are and doing the traffic analysis uh, and looking at what those requirements will be, everything from queuing lengths on turns, number of turns, locations for left-hand turns. All of those things are the early components that are really on the field side and the analysis side uh, to see what the effects are, are going to be on, on traffic and let us progress the physical design. Uh, we are now starting to look at the station entrances and all the ventilation that is needed. Uh, and I had a briefing this morning uh, on a tunnel analysis that we're having done to determine the type of tunnel that would be proposed to go ahead and would be done basically uh, for the core of the system uh, in the tunnel sections. Next slide. 
This is what we've got basically for the soil profile. Uh, we've already gone through uh, and done soil borings, particularly under the lake, uh, to go ahead and look at which soil strata we're going to be in. Uh, a lot of the alignment uh, is in the Austin chalk, uh, which is excellent for tunneling. Uh, we then get into shale in some locations. And as we go ahead and get back to uh, the surface on the south side of the lake, uh, we're basically getting into something that is going to be some mixed face uh, back into the more granular uh, soil, alluvium, and things of that nature. So that, that's a start of what we've gotten so that we can start to look at which tunnel technology methodology we should use uh, for one of the key components of the system. Next slide. On the red line, uh, we're doing a series of different projects on the red line to increase uh, the investment to provide greater capacity uh, and more service. The first project that we're currently starting uh, the design on is the new station at McCullough at the soccer stadium. Uh, we've got the FTA approval for the categorical exclusion uh, and we continue to progress where we're going with the overall design ongoing coordination with the city. Uh, and very shortly, we're gonna have the first solicitation out, uh, which will be for a design build contract for the station. Uh, Broadmoor uh, is another station. Uh, it is a joint venture with the adjacent developer. Uh, and that's gonna go ahead and give basically that adjacent to the development uh, for a good sense and ease of transfer. Uh, it, it will wind up with us at that point, connecting to the trail. Uh, and also changing some of the other things in one of our adjacent stations. Uh, Lake Lyon to Leander uh, is a section that we're gonna go ahead and do some double tracking. That's gonna allow us to go ahead and run at a greater frequency on the red line. Uh, and with a lot of the improvements that we're doing, uh, it really is going to improve the performance and the operability of the overall red line. Next slide, please. It, as I go ahead and go through this, I wanted to give you basically a flavor uh, for what we have advanced the overall program for Orange and Blue Line as a result of the 15% design. Uh, so I want to go ahead and go through different portions of the, each one of the alignments uh, to give you a picture of where we are, uh, the points that we're getting ready to go out to the public. Uh, to be able to go ahead and make the technical decisions as well as the community decisions that have to be made as we go from the 15% out to the 30% design. Next slide. The northern portion of the system uh, is basically the orange line uh, that will be that core line that goes down the center. It's really the spine of the system. The part that will ultimately be the termination of the orange line is at Eckridge, uh, but currently in the initial investment, we're gonna go ahead and go from North Lamar to the South. So at a later date, that portion from North Lamar up to Tech Ridge uh, will be built and put into operation. Next slide. This gives us more of the heart of the system. And if I start again at the North Lamar Transit Center, uh, it basically is the heart of the orange line that goes from North Lamar Transit Center down through the drag, down Guadalupe, uh, and then across the lake uh, and down South Congress. That is an area that also is going to have some interlining between the orange and the blue line. Uh, the blue line will originate out at the airport uh, and come in over a new bridge that will be between waterfront uh, and come up Trinity and across Fourth, and then be able to go ahead and interline with the orange line. Uh, that will give us a frequency that we can get to a five minute frequency on the orange and blue line between North Lamar uh, and Republic Square in the center. Uh, we also have got the option as we go further to take the goal line when it does get switched over to light rail and do the inner lining that would also go south across the lake down past auditorium shores. Next slide, please. 
This shows a better pictorial of what that gold line interlining would be with the orange line. Uh, it comes across the lake, as I said, uh, and then interlines all the way to the South Congress Transit Center. So we're going from major transfer hubs and transit centers at the north and south to be able to go ahead and do that interlining, which will provide that better frequency, uh, basically to the core of the system. The blue line, as I mentioned before, uh, starts out of the airport, basically comes across Riverside and then crosses the lake uh, onto Trinity, right at the foot of Trinity, uh, over the top of where the current boathouse is. Next slide. If I get into a little more specifics and walk through each one of the lines, the portion of the blue line uh, that originates at the airport, uh, the current location of that station would basically be to go in between the two existing parking garages. Uh, it would put us with a direct connection to the terminal. Uh, similar to what's there, if you're familiar with San Francisco, uh, where you come off the end of the platform and directly into the airport. Uh, we then swing around uh, from the airport, basically run the area along 71 uh, and down until we cross over 183 uh, right at Riverside. That's another location that we will have what is now the Metro Center Station. We're, we're still working through the exact location of that, whether it's on the north side uh, or the south side of 71, but on Riverside. Uh, there also will be the location where we will have a park and ride. Uh, that park and ride would give direct access for somebody who is coming northbound on 71 to go ahead and get into town that then would give the opportunity for them to go to the park and ride, get immediately onto the blue line that would take them down into the heart of downtown. Next slide, please. Moving in further uh, from Metro Center and still along East Riverside, uh, we've got the Montopolis Station, uh, followed by Fire and also Riverside. The station spacing uh, is about a mile apart, uh, so that we basically have got that service area uh, that is within about a 10 minute walk shed uh, with where the overlaps here uh, are to go ahead and in this case, get it down to about a half mile radius. Next slide. One of the challenging and interesting places that we've got uh, is along Lakeshore uh, and then the crossing of I-35. We've got extensive coordination that we're doing right now with TxDOT uh, with the central portion of I-35 that they now have got uh, in the schematic stage uh, to go ahead and make sure that as we go ahead on Riverside to cross 35, that the system is integrated and that the guideway is there, uh, center running at grade across 35 as we go from the Lakeshore Station over to Travis Heights. Again, staying on Riverside until we get to the point that we make the turn to go towards Trinity, uh, basically with the waterfront station. Next slide. We have got, I'm gonna leave the heart of downtown until we come back to it basically at the end. Uh, this gives you the Southern end of the orange line. Uh, as I had said previously, the portions of the orange line, the extension to the North uh, and to the South, this is the Southern end uh, that we would build as far as the Stastny station right now. Uh, and then in the future, the extension would go to William Cannon and ultimately down to Slaughter. Next slide. Moving up to the north, it takes you to the South Congress Transit Center, uh, the location that ultimately we would have the inner lining uh, between the orange and the gold line. Uh, next station goes at St. Ed's uh, and then into Old Torf, uh, right next to where the current HEB is and the property that's across the street that used to be a strip shopping center that's going to have uh, a major development uh, adjacent to the station. Next slide. One of the things that we're working through right now uh, in SoCo uh, is location of station, uh, whether that is going to be at grade or whether that will be below grade. 
Uh, it's one of the options that we're looking at and getting input from the community as we go forward in the process. Uh, there's two different options. One would be to go ahead in daylight as soon as we could from the tunnel uh, that would be in the general vicinity of Nelly Street. Uh, that, that would go ahead and put the station uh, at the surface further down in SoCo. Uh, the other alternative is to go ahead and continue the tunnel. I uh, have an underground station midway through SoCo uh, and daylight down at Live Oak. Uh, as I kind of turn the corner going from South Congress, again, picking up Riverside uh, to where the Auditorium Shore Station would be, there would be multiple entrances to that uh, to be able to go ahead and get over to provide the right entranceway and transportation for major events in and out of Auditorium Shores. We then go ahead and put the tunnel uh, and we go under the lake. Initially, we thought we could go ahead uh, and build a bridge to go over the lake, but with a combination of utility interferences on the north side of the lake uh, and what it would take to go ahead and get from the tunnel uh, that originally was intended to go through to Republic Square, uh, it became an impossibility to do that uh, unless we closed one of the streets and it would have been one of the major streets like Second Street. So that has taken us between the utility conflicts uh, and the potential closure of streets to go ahead uh, and go with the tunnel under the lake as opposed to uh, what's there for the overall bridge. Continuing to the north uh, beyond Republic Square, uh, you get to the government center. Uh, that basically is something that is immediately adjacent to a lot of the development that's going to occur uh, in that complex. Uh, that we're having continuous discussions on how that is going to be done and what the interface will be coming across to that station. Going back into the center of town for the blue line uh, and working from Republic Square uh, back to what would be the east, uh, halfway or thereabouts between Guadalupe and Trinity uh, would be the Congress Avenue station. Uh, that would be one of the major hubs of downtown. Uh, right in the corner of Congress and Fourth, uh, in between Republic Square and the Congress Station, and going all the way around to Rainey uh, would be an upper level concourse, uh, so that it would be that area that people could go from one station to the other without having to do anything that would switch lines, uh, to be able to give that better access across downtown. We also would put a station entrance uh, right where the current red line is in front of the existing convention center. That ultimately would also be the termination uh, for what the green line would be coming in from Colony Park. So that really gives you what that part of downtown is. The tunnel portion, if you will, um, goes from where the Rainy Mac station is really at the foot of Trinity. Uh, up and around to 4th Street, uh, and then to the south under the lake, uh, over to we daylight on South Congress, with the other portion of the tunnel going to the north and daylighting somewhere in the general vicinity of what will be the government center station, with the potential to go ahead and go a little bit further and maybe go under uh, some of the other intersections. So that's the part that really is that central alignment. It's the heart of the heart, if you will, of both the blue uh, and the orange line. And it gives that capability, as I said, for the increase in frequency of the blue line going all the way to North Lamar. And ultimately, when we go ahead and change the gold line from the bus rapid transit over to basically what will be the same type of light rail that we can interline to the south on the orange line uh, to South Congress Transit Center. So it gives you that increase in frequency, that increase in capacity uh, that we get by being able to go ahead uh, and do that interlining. Next slide, please. Th this basically takes us a little bit further to the north beyond the heart of downtown, uh, picking up what will be a station at UT and the mall. We're looking at various alternatives for what happens to the drag uh, in terms of travel lanes, uh, the utilization of that for entranceways. 
potentially a transit way. So those are the things that we still have got under consideration, uh, basically for the length of the drag. Uh, the next station takes us up to Hemp Hill Park, and then we make the turn to continue going north uh, on Guadalupe. Next slide, please. We then get up to the triangle uh, where we start to make the transition uh, going from Guadalupe at that station up to North Lamar. Next slide. And as we continue to go further to the north, uh, we've got Koenig, what will be just station right there on the corner next to the state hospital. Uh, Crestview is going to be a major transfer station because it is at the location where the existing red line station is. So that configuration will allow for a transfer that if somebody is coming in from the north, from Leander, and want to get to the heart of downtown, want to get to Republic Square, instead of continuing on the red line all the way down to get to the convention center, that will be a transfer point where people can go ahead and switch over to either the blue line uh, or to the orange line to go ahead and make that trip down and be right at the section that's in front of Republic Square. So that's gonna be one of our major points that we're gonna anticipate heavy transfers out and in, into the future. Beyond that, we go to the North Lamar Transit Center. That's located, we will go through the underpass and under the I-30, I-183 uh, frontage roads uh, and come up right in front of the existing North Lamar Transit Center. Uh, basically put an elevated walkway from that center station up and over into what in the future will be redeveloped at the existing North Lamar Transit Center. So that's the end of what we will have as the initial investment on the orange line. Uh, next slide, please. Takes us up from North Lamar Transit Center to what will be that full build out of the orange line from the North Lamar Transit Center up through Runberg, Breaker, Armour, and then ultimately a station at the end of the line, which is where our current uh, Tech Ridge Park and Ride and bus area is uh, basically on the east side of I-35. Next slide, please. These, again, going back to the same point, uh, we always focus and go back to what the key milestones are. Uh, and as I've said, we've progressed now through obtaining FTA approval for project development. We'll continue through the environmental process, work on the 30% design with the objective of getting to the final FEIS and record of decision in the winter of 2022. Next slide. Uh, this is a rendering that we had done, which shows what I was talking about earlier uh, of the station at the airport, um, sliding in between the two parking garages. Uh, that portion of the system will be all aerial. Uh, and what we're looking to do is to have that same kind of connection uh, that will butt right straight into what the rebuilt and reconfigured airport will be. Um, so that will be a major location. Uh, that will provide that ability to be able to get from downtown or from North Lamar or from any of the other locations on the Orange Line with a direct connection into basically the airport terminal. Next slide. That's basically the conclusion of what I wanted to go ahead and give you as an update uh, to the progress to date on the program. Uh, it, it is a program that I believe and have believed from the time I got here uh, three years into Austin uh, that basically is very much needed for a city of this size. Uh, when you look at what the population growth will be uh, by 2040 with a doubling uh, and an almost unbelievable fact of that there's 150 people or so uh, that move into Austin on a daily basis. Uh, we can't in any way look to anybody to build additional roads or lanes to work past the issues of the traffic congestion. Uh, so we look forward uh, to moving forward with the program to the approval of the referendum that puts it in place. Uh, 
basically at the last election. Uh, and look forward to giving you updates uh, in the future as we progress through the program. Paul? Awesome. Well, thank you very much, David. We, we really appreciate the, the time and the presentation. Um, if you have a, a few minutes, we, we do have a few questions uh, that people have asked in the chat. Uh, of course. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to try to take these in the order I received them. Uh, David Calabwe asks, uh, what are the anti-displacements? Uh, the anti-displacements, uh, that is something that is new to a program like this. Uh, there is $300 million that is built into the overall $7.1 billion budget. Uh, and it's looked to be able to do things that retains locations uh, for individuals to be able to go ahead and remain in areas, particularly in sections uh, where we're doing work that will be a station uh, to go ahead and preserve that uh, so that there are not things that then cause a whole series of relocations. It also has the potential uh, for utilization uh, as redevelopment is done for people to be able to re return to that same area. So it's something that is trying to maintain the character of the area uh, and not have people displaced to other parts of the city. <laughs> I did it. I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, next question that I see is from uh, Joe Gosling. Uh, he asks, is the grade separated red line crossing at Lamarin Airport included in ATD's work? Uh, there will be, we're looking at a couple of different alternatives. There will be a grade separation uh, between the red line and the freight line, uh, the common lines, uh, and also the light rail system. We're looking at a couple of alternatives right now. Uh, but that is something that will have a great separation. Yes. I saw one that popped up a minute ago that really is the one of the more challenging ones. And the question was about real estate and utilities as a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, every single project that I've ever been involved with, uh, it is real estate acquisition and it is utility construction. So there's a couple of things that we're doing to go ahead and mitigate that. Uh, we're going to go out with a very early utility relocation contract uh, to get those interferences out of the way uh, before we let the major contracts. And right now, we're already working our way through what the necessary real estate will be so that when we get to the end of the environmental, we're ready to jump right off and start to acquire real estate. Sorry, I just wanted to focus on that one. No, that's great. I, I think that was uh, Sharon Hamilton's question. Uh, I think she also snuck in an extra one since we're we're on her question. Uh, uh, out by the Oak Hill Station, can we get an arrow pointing out towards Dripping Springs? Um, Oak Hill is going to be the, it's right now intended to be bus rapid transit. Uh, that's one that's going to be a little bit down the road. Uh, as anybody who is in that area knows, TxDOT right now is in the process of redoing all of that interchange. Uh, and ultimately, what we will wind up doing is extending that bus rapid transit uh, basically out to a lot that is going to be by the uh, Pinnacle campus uh, so that we've got that area going through. Uh, but with everything that's going to happen in that area over the next period of years, which right now the projected completion date for TxDOT is 2026, uh, that's not something that we're going to initiate right away. Uh, the other portion of the extension, which is really our 803 service, uh, is going to go ahead and go further to the south from Westgate uh, down Mancheca uh, to provide service in that area. Uh, but the other portion will come later in the process. All right. Uh Anna Maria Torres uh, wants to know, with uh, all of the tunnel and at grade options for stations, uh, are the stations anticipated to be ADA accessible? Everything that we do will be ADA accessible. That, that is a given. Uh, it is something that as we go through and look at making sure uh, that all the stations are accessible, uh, the vast majority of all the surface stations are gonna be center running. 
Uh, so we need to be able to make the connections back to uh, the sidewalk network and if necessary, uh, provide the right ramps and things at those corners. Uh, and then also sidewalk extensions to be able to go ahead uh, and get people safely to the stations. Uh, underground is going to be a series of escalators and elevators to be able to go ahead and get into those stations. Uh, probably a two tiered section that gets from the surface to the concourse and then down ultimately to the track level. Uh, and there will be a series of both, as I said, escalators uh, and elevators, plural. Um, that, that one elevator is something that I've lived through before. Uh, it doesn't give you the redundancy. You have to try and do things when it goes out and they go out. Uh, to be able to continue to have that ADA access uh, using that second elevator. All right, great. Um, Paul Jensen asks, uh, what is the program for the extension projects? Uh, are there triggers for those projects uh, or do they start the process when the construction of this initial build is underway, uh, sort of like it was a phase two? Okay, uh, what we basically are doing as part of the environmental process, the NEPA process, uh, is we are clearing the entire length of the orange line all the way from Tech Ridge to uh, Slaughter at the south end environmentally, so that we've got that put behind us. Ultimately, it will be that build out of those sections. That really comes down to timing, uh, availability of funding, uh, we're fortunate that in the referendum that passed last year, uh, it's a different type of funding sources than most other locations around the country. Uh, it basically is a TRE, a tax rate election. So it's not like a sales tax or a penny out of sales tax that a lot of properties have. The big advantage of it also uh, is because it was a tax rate election, it continues in perpetuity. So it gives us the money to go ahead and do the capital, the operating, the maintenance, the state of good repair. So a lot of it with when those extensions get done really comes down to the financial side and the timing and the cash flow. All right. Uh, Josh Carter wants to know, uh, do you have a plan for procurement of the design after 30%? Uh, and if so, when uh, might a procurement be released? Um, we're looking at all different types of contracting models. Whether some of it is gonna be conventional design bid build, whether it's gonna be design build, whether it's gonna be progressive design build, we're gonna do a risk analysis based upon financial and contracting types that is gonna happen next spring. Based upon that analysis, there's the high probability that different parts of the program will be done in different contract models depending upon what that result is. Uh, then we'll know whether the engineering work will be included in some of those, for example, design build, or whether we could go out for a complete 100% design uh, that then would go out into the contracting community uh, for a bid. So that's a few months away for us making those kinds of decisions. Uh, each one has its pluses and minuses, advantages. Uh, so that's what we've got to weigh uh, is which parts of the system would be done in which way. Great. Uh, okay, uh, Paul Jensen again, uh, he wants to know this time, are there public private partnerships for this program uh, and are there maintenance agreements? I'd, I'd love to see a public private partnership. Uh, public private partnerships in transit are few and far between. Uh, there's only been a couple of them that have been successful. Uh, the, the thing that's there is transit is something uh, that is really a public service, that it is not something that what you get from the fare box uh, is sufficient to go ahead uh, and operate the system. So the ability to go ahead and enter into a public-private partnership with some kind of a return to return on investment, I should say, uh, to that private entity is difficult to do in transit. Uh, so there are not too many of them that have come along. There's not too many of them uh, that have been successful. Uh, in terms of the operating model, uh, that's something that is also under discussion uh, of how that's done. What we know right now 
uh, is that the operation will be done by Cap Metro. And as I said earlier, uh, there is a whole staff to build everything from the technician that works on the rail cars to train control, the supervision to an engineering staff, all of those things that really don't exist right now in Austin because there isn't a light rail system. That's something that has to get built up over time. Uh, and with that will come the decisions on operations. Okay. Uh, all right, next up, uh, Jim Wesovich wants to know how much of the overall budget is dependent on the infrastructure bill currently being worked through uh, Congress? Pick up your phone and call. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, right now, what we've got projected, uh, which is historically what has come along, uh, is basically 45% is what is in the financial model uh, for the low, for the match by feds. So that's 55%, and I'm referring basically to the orange and the blue lines. Uh, there is the potential for that 45% increase. Uh, that's something that we're watching very, very closely. Uh, what's going on for infra to go ahead and see if that potential is there. Uh, to go from 45 back to 50. At one point in time, it was two thirds, one thirds, and over the years, uh, it has decreased. So hopefully that may be something that would be of great benefit if that does increase. All righty. Uh, next up, Noah McElhon uh, is interested in uh, understanding the advantages of using light rail versus uh, advanced bus rapid transit. Uh, and related, will there be off-board fare collection? Um, the intention uh, is that we will have off-board fare collection. Uh, it decreases the dwell time that you have when you pull into a station, uh, as opposed to waiting for onboard fare collection. Uh, so that will be something that will improve performance and let us go ahead uh, and maintain the shorter headways. Uh, so, so that's something. That, that is there and that we will uh, basically be doing. Uh, I've lost the other half of the question, I apologize. Uh, what are the advantages of using light rail versus advanced bus rapid transit? What, what it comes down to is when we did the analysis of the future ridership, it's based on the Campo 2040 and 2045 models, is that if we had gone ahead and used the bus rapid transit, uh, that by the time that we got to 2040 approximately, that it would be at capacity. That when you're looking at the type and value of the long-term investment, uh, that translates to going ahead and switching over to light rail. Uh, the light rail has capacity going out well into the future. And there's a second thing that we've done as we've started to go through the design and it's the advantage of the downtown tunnel. Uh, there is the capability uh, that gets to a longer platform. We're restrained at the street level uh, by the lengths of the blocks, which is around 280 feet, uh, which only gives us the capability of getting to either two or three car consists. If we go to a 400 foot long platform underground, it greatly increases what we've got for capacity. And once we get out of the downtown area, uh, there are opportunities at every location, except for one, uh, to be able to get that same 400 foot. So in addition to giving you that additional capacity that you've got uh, that's needed for the future, it's that next step that takes you beyond that by going ahead and being able to take the platforms from what is restrained by a city block to a longer length. So it takes that capacity and pushes it further out. Okay, excellent. Um, just a few more here. I, I've got three more. I think that will probably be all we have time for. Um, Augustine Beringia asks, uh, are there any proposed maintenance yards planned uh, to maintain and repair the vehicles? Yeah, there will be one maintenance yard uh, for the fleet. We're looking at several sites that are out the blue line uh, towards the end of the line in the 71-183 airport area. Uh, so there will be one maintenance facility. 
uh, that will take care of the fleet for both the orange and the blue line and ultimately the gold line. Okay. Uh, D. Caldwell, sorry, don't have a first name, uh, asks, is there any talk of adding Northeast Travis County, uh, specifically Pflugerville, to the system? Pflugerville is outside of the service area. Uh, so what we can do is provide the service into those areas. Uh, and then if there is a desire uh, to have additional service, that's something that Cap Metro can contract for. Uh, and, and there always is the potential uh, for different cities to go ahead and become part of. It's something that has been done previously. It's something that there's examples in Dallas at DART uh, where cities have decided that they wanna become part of the regional system. So that's a step in the process. Uh, so it's just something that over time, uh, like everything grows with ridership and systems grow with ridership, that, that's something that has the potential in the future. Okay. And last one, uh, are mobility as a service apps uh, being considered for people to pay one source for all transportation needs uh, from source to destination, uh, light rail, city bus, commuter rail, taxi, bike, scooter rental, all in that, that That's something that is an objective. Uh, everything that we have will be one fair media for every service that is there uh, that's being provided, whether it is commuter, whether it's commuter rail, whether it is light rail, whether it's bus, all that will be one common fair media. We're looking to our other regional partners uh, and that's the best thing to have for any city. Uh, is that ability to have that one fair media. So that's something that we're looking at. It's a goal for the future. All right, awesome. Well, thank you again, uh, David. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, lots of questions here. We, we really appreciate you sticking around uh, and answering them for us. Uh, and we're, I think, uh, pretty much everyone on this call uh, is looking very much forward to seeing how the program uh, progresses into the future. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and anytime you'd like to go ahead and get a further update, just let me know. Excellent. We will make sure to keep that in mind. Okay. Y'all take care and have a great day. Thank you. You too. Uh, Sam, I think we can uh, turn it back over to you uh, to wrap us up here. Okay. Well, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Cap Metro and Project Connect for presenting uh, to transformational development in our city that's been tossed around and voted upon and re-voted upon and uh, finally it looks like progress is taking hold so um, I do want to thank everybody for your attendance at today's luncheon at this time I would like to ask our outgoing membership chair Augustine if we can have the head count and Augustine may have been accidentally listed as a not a panelist and so I apologize uh -oh. um, I did see a peak number around 105 so uh, that may uh, help us out here um, so that concludes our luncheon for today uh, we do look forward to everyone at our next luncheon October 19th uh, we'll be hosting um, the University of Texas Capital Planning and Construction Department uh, director Jim Shackelford and his deputy Michael Ueda and they will be discussing a multitude of projects, uh, the purpose of their department, and specifically the South End Zone and the Red River alignment. So it'll have structures, roads, development, uh, program management, you name it. We're just hitting all the highlights. So uh, with that, we can call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Sam. Thank you, everybody.